some health inequities, and how to prioritize some of the issues that those populations feel they need to address in order to help them increase their health outcomes. Um, with that, the, the, the purpose, as many of you know, of this, of, of this uh, webinar is to really help our healthy communities partners across the state of Kansas uh, to uh, put a kind of a, the health equity lens on the work, the future work of our healthy communities uh, work. Um, <clears throat> our board uh, two weeks ago today approved um, a three and a half year healthy communities initiative uh, improving health equity in Kansas. Uh, so the, the primary work will be to identify, as we, as we, uh, as as many of you know, we asked our healthy communities to prioritize a policy priority uh, to work the, our healthy communities work across the state of Kansas. And the notion of prioritizing it was to really help um, our leadership teams to uh, build that policy muscle, so to speak. Uh, our assumption was that by doing that and focusing on a policy priority, uh, the leadership teams across the state of Kansas would get a clear understanding around how they can, can, can change policy on behalf of their community. And our assumption was that they would do it in a variety of different ways, and I, I think we've found that that has happened. So with this next round of, of funding that our board has approved, uh, we're going to ask you to identify a population or a community or a neighborhood and build the health equity muscle. So um, you'll learn a lot more about the, the, the upcoming RFP at uh, three meetings that we have scheduled uh, for March 8th will be in Gardens or in Topeka. March 10th will be here in Wichita and in March 13th it'll be in Garden City. Details will be coming out when the RFP is released, released in February. Uh, it's tentatively planned to be released February 27th of uh, this month. Um, so, so, but I want I want everyone on the phone to know that we're going to focus on this webinar, and I don't want you to ask me any questions about the RFP uh, until we have those web, those opportunities to meet in Garden City, Topeka, and Wichita, and we'll also provide a webinar that we'll record at the Wichita set, set, setting. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adrian for some housekeeping items. Hi, this is Adrian Payne-Andrews with the Healthy Communities Initiative. Just a couple of housekeeping items. All of your phone lines are muted to help reduce background noise. Uh, please use your audio pin so that your lines can be unmuted if necessary. Uh, please make sure your computer speakers are turned off or muted to help eliminate background noise. And as usual, we're going to go ahead and record the webinar and archive it on SharePoint, hopefully later this week or early next. Throughout the webinar, time will be set aside for questions. Please type any questions that you have in the chat box on the right side of your screen, and uh, Jeff and Blair will help monitor those questions. We'll close with announcements about upcoming events and due dates. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to with Sarah and Tatiana. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Adrian. And welcome to the webinar, Addressing Health Inequities, How to Identify and Prioritize Issues. I'm joined by my colleague, Tatiana Lin, also of the Kansas Health Institute. KHI is a nonpartisan, nonprofit health policy and research organization based in Topeka. Our purpose is to provide data and evidence to support decision making for better health in Kansas. Our learning objectives for the webinar today are to identify and recognize health disparities in Kansas, to become familiar with some of the data and tools available to you to identify health disparities in your own communities, to learn about processes for prioritizing action on disparities, and to become familiar with best practices for meaningfully engaging with impacted populations. For those of you who are at the Healthy Communities Initiative convening in Wichita in October, we'll revisit some of the concepts that were discussed at that meeting and build on those concepts to discuss how to meaningfully engage with community members and how to identify priorities for action. Some of you may not have been at that meeting, so we'll do a brief review of the foundational information that was shared. But before we go any further, we have two poll questions for you. And the first one is, what excites you the most about working on health equity in your community? Uh, so if you could pull up that poll question, um, that poll is 
open. Uh, so if you want to take just a minute to those participants who are here on the webinar to share with us what you're most excited about working on regarding health equity in your community. And we gave you some options. Uh, connecting with a new population that you haven't worked with before, making meaningful, meaningful change in the community, learning about issues of vulnerable populations, bringing additional funding to the community, or other. We know that there are a variety of reasons that you might be excited about working on health equity in your community. So take just a couple more minutes, or not more minutes, <laughs> a few more moments um, to respond to that. And I believe once it's closed, Blair will share with us the results. All right. Let's see. It looks like most people are most excited about making a meaningful ch meaningful change in the community at 63%. Um, so we are very excited that people are excited and energized around um, really making a difference for those populations who need it in the community. We have a second question that we'd like to gather your feedback on, which is what is one of your primary challenges in working in health equity? We know that it is exciting and we are also excited for you to make meaningful change, but we know that there are some challenges um, to engaging in this issue and um, this topic. So we gave you some options here as well, lack of knowledge about equity, no existing relationship with vulnerable populations, competing priorities, the ability to sustain the work on the long term. Um, and a lack of comfort in the community about issues of race and ethnicity. So if you could just take a moment to look at those reasons, we know there may be others, um, and select the one that's most relevant to you as you are thinking about the work of equity in your community. Again, we'll give you a, a few more seconds to think about and respond to the poll. And then Blair, if you want to let me know what the results look like, I can share those. Okay. So the most frequently selected is the ability to sustain the work long term, um, which is which is a very um, very pertinent concern because taking um, taking time to do health equity work really does require a commitment over the long term um, to engage with um, and to build trust among the populations um, that are affected by many of these health equity issues. So, so hopefully we'll be able to both um, continue to energize you about making meaningful change in the community um, and provide some tips on um, how you can engage with those populations, hopefully meaningfully over the long term. So thank you so much for participating um, in that poll. So let's go ahead and discuss how to identify disparities and equities in your community. Uh, first, we'll start with some definitions. So a health disparity is defined as differences in health status and mortality rates across population groups, which can sometimes be expected. Uh, so a disparity is essentially a difference. An example might be cancer rates in elderly versus children. You may expect um, that illness rates are higher um, as, as people age. Another example may be breast cancer rates among women versus rates among men. Um, so that, that's another biological difference that we may expect. A health inequity is differences in health status and mortality rates across population groups that are systemic, avoidable, unfair, and unjust. So a health and, a, and health and equity is also a difference, but it's an unfair one. So an example here might be cancer mortality for low income versus high income people. And that's something that we might decide is avoidable and unfair. But there can be very different opinions about what is unfair and avoidable and about whose job it is to do something about it. So this is one of the primary reasons that equity work can be challenging. Another graphic to reiterate the point on the difference between inequities and disparities 
Both are differences. Not all disparities are inequities, but health inequities are also disparities. The differentiator is the why. So what is the root cause of the disparity, and is it avoidable or unfair? Here's a graphic that's used by the California Endowment, which does a lot of work on equity. We can use it to help think about the root causes of inequities in our community. We know that many people understand health in the way that is shown here on the right hand of the screen. Health behaviors such as hand washing, exercising, smoking, and what you eat can impact rates of disease and injury and ultimately how long or how well we live. This is the model that our health care system operates under, and there are different ways to intervene at these different levels. To treat illnesses, we have clinics and hospitals. To change behaviors, we educate people about the actions that they should take. In public health, we also know that environments shape our behaviors. The places where we live, work, and play can impact our health. And differences in these environments lead to differences in health status for individuals. Now, when we're working on reducing inequities, we also have to start to move even upstream from that and ask why our environments are different. Often this is due to how institutional power is exercised and how the policies and practices of businesses, government, and other agencies shape our neighborhoods and our work environments. And often, differences in how power is exercised can be driven by discriminatory beliefs. So these are the things, those isms that we hear about, racism, sexism, classism, ageism, et cetera. But how do we make differences in those areas, and how can we identify when these are the drivers of our disparities? So we're going to look to data to show us differences in the social conditions, the behaviors, and the health outcomes to show us where those differences are, and then we'll dig into the why um, they exist. So how do we diagnose if there are inequities in our communities? First, we look at these differences in health status. There may be differences by age, gender, race or ethnicity, geography, and other characteristics. How can we find them and determine whether they are inequities? First, we want to ask these questions. What are the differences between the groups within my community, and how does my community look different or the same as others in Kansas? So we can select an indicator, which would be a measure of health outcomes, behaviors, or the social determinants for, in this example, obesity rates, and see how it looks different by race, geography, income, or education. We can look at which groups are doing well and not so well, and what might be driving those differences. So here's an example. This graph shows some data um, about the differences in educational attainment by race and ethnicity in Kansas. The yellow bars are college degrees, and the blue bars represent the percent of adults with high school degrees. What can we see? Well, we can see that a much greater proportion of whites achieve high school and college degrees than the other groups. The difference in high school degree attainment between whites and Hispanics is quite large. There's a difference of about 30 percentage points between the two groups. And why might that be? Well, it could be because of the education system in the places where Hispanic adults immigrated from. It might be because, as children, they had to work to support their families instead of attending school. So what about college degree attainment? There are differences here as well between the groups. Why? Well, college degrees are expensive. In general, whites have higher incomes than both other groups and may be, may, may be more able to afford college. However, higher educational attainment can also lead to higher incomes, thus leading to the future ability to provide education for children and, and grandchildren. And here's where we start to see the cyclical nature of disadvantage when it comes to education um, and income and poverty. Here's another graph. This one shows median income by educational attainment. So we can see that those with less than a high school degree make about $23,000, while those with a graduate or professional degree make more than twice and almost three times as much, almost $60,000. Why? Well, because they have different access to jobs. And we can ask, is this fair? Well, maybe it's fair. Uh, they worked hard for those degrees. But what isn't fair is if people weren't provided the same opportunities to get the same levels of education. Moving to behaviors, we also know that income is related to the ability to eat healthy foods such as fruits and vegetables. This graph shows inadequate vegetable consumption, not eating vegetables at least once a day, by income. We can see that there is more inadequate consumption among those with the lowest annual household income, so those making less than $15,000 a year. Um, about a third of them are not eating adequate vegetables. Um, and they are about half, uh, or less than, they're about half of 
um, the rate for those making more than $50,000 a year. Their inadequate consumption rate is about one-fifth or 17%. So is this unfair? Maybe it is. If people are excluded from higher paying jobs because of their gender or race and then are unable to afford healthy foods, then perhaps it's unfair. If people who live in lower income neighborhoods don't have access to fruits and vegetables because grocery stores choose not to locate there because they don't think their profits will be high enough, then perhaps that's an unfair um, exercise, exercise of institutional power. But some people argue that people have their own, abil their own ability to make choices about what they eat and that's their own business. So what we choose to eat or what we are able to eat has an impact on our health. This graph shows differences in obesity by race and ethnicity. Again, we see that whites are doing better. They have lower rates of obesity than blacks or Hispanics. Is this fair? Well, maybe. If the cycle of disadvantage has influenced the choices that they're able to make, then no, it's not fair. But what about if there are racial differences in how obesity relates to other diseases, such as heart disease or diabetes? Are those differences fair? Are they avoidable? That's tougher to answer. So equity work is really tricky, especially when you're looking through data and trying to decide whether a difference is an inequity. We also know that there are geographical differences in the social determinants. This map shows unemployment in the state. As a result, an entire community may have less access to income and earnings than other communities. So we can see regions of the state um, where unemployment is higher than in other regions. And this has a big impact on not just access to, but the quality of education and other resources like healthy foods. What we know is that these things are all connected, the social determinants, behaviors, chronic diseases. Differences in the social determinants lead to differences in health outcomes. And to make progress, we need to identify those root causes of the differences, the social determinants, and the things that shape our environment, such as the differential application of institutional power that we talked about at the beginning. And these are the things that matter when thinking about disparities in health equity. We have to think about place, race, class, and a variety of other things. Um, these matter when we're thinking about differences between population groups and whether or not they are unfair and avoidable. So how can you find the same information for your community? Well, here are a few data sources and tools that you can use. Kansas Health Matters is a one-stop shop uh, for data and information about Kansas communities. Uh, the Kansas Health Matters website has information by um, a variety of health indicators and also has a disparities dashboard. So you can see breakouts um, by age, race, um, and gender in some cases. The county health ranking shows geographical disparities. So data at the county level um, for all the counties, or almost all the counties in Kansas. The Community Commons website has a wealth of information, lots of data indicators, and uses maps um, to show uh, differences uh, at sub-county levels, often at um, the census tract, census tract level, so you can identify differences within your community. And then there are also other sources. Um, Kansas Information for Communities at KDHE has birth and death data. The Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or BRFIS. Um, many of these indicators are on Kansas Health Matters, but there are additional ones on the KDHE site. My personal favorite uh, is the American Fact Finder um, from the, that has information about the American Community Survey and the Census Bureau. Um, they provide information at the county and sub-county level um, by aggregating different years of data together. So now that we've identified some of the disparities, at least in Kansas, and shared some of the resources that you can use to identify disparities in your own communities, we want to think about prioritizing and addressing them. Um, so why is there a difference between these groups? And we asked those questions as we went along. What do those impacted by the issue think about it? And we're going to talk about that. And then what is driving the difference? And especially, what can we do to reduce it? So before I hand it over to Tatiana, uh, we want to ask you another question. So uh, Blair, if you want to launch the next poll question, we'd like to hear from you. In your opinion, what contributes most to health disparities in your own community? Is it behaviors, the social determinants of health, imbalances of power between groups or institutions, discriminatory beliefs such as racism, or, um, or the policies that are put in place? We know there may be others. Um, but from that, from that list, which ones are uh, the ones that contribute most to the health disparities that you see in the work that you do?
So take about a minute and think about that and respond to that question. All right, go ahead and take just a couple more seconds to wrap up your responses, and then we'll go ahead and close that poll. All right, so let's see. All right. It sounds like the social determinants of health are the primary drivers um, in our communities uh, at 65%. Um, the behaviors uh, is, was the one that was rated lowest at 26. Um, so differences in those social determinants of health certainly drive um, health disparities in our communities. We also know that power is one of the big contributors um, to health disparities. And power can be defined as the ability to make decisions about one's own circumstances. We know that um, political structures often exclude those who are vulnerable, those who may not be literate or who don't speak English um, or who have certain other disadvantage, disadvantages such as disabilities. Um, so their exclusion from the political process and from civic engagement can exacerbate vulnerability because these decisions are made without their input and can also lead to their further exclusion from decision making and policy making processes. So I'm going to hand it over to Tatiana at this point to talk about how we can engage those populations um, to enable them to participate in decision making at the community level. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sarah talked about the importance of data, however, a community data is really critical and important to identify disparities, but that this work of inequity would not be possible without really engaging with the communities. So, I would like to start with a quote from the recent publication of Health Affairs. And the quote says, in the end, all parties can benefit by joining hands, and the door to these possibilities opens with authentic engagement. What this quote really signifies that we should really focus on long-term vision when we're thinking about engaging with the communities, and really striving really hard to engage them authentically. So why is it important to engage in communities? You probably have observed it in your own, um, in your backyard, in your back home, that some of the decisions that, have, that are made sometimes do not really include the voices of those vulnerable populations that might have been actually impacted by those policies and those decisions. Nothing about us without us. This should be really the motto of policy making or decision making, and what it really means that we need to do the best we can to integrate those vulnerable populations in decision making. And it can take different forms and shapes. So what you see on this slide is a pyramid. And this pyramid highlights three different levels of engagement. So you can see at the bottom, the first one is direct engagement with community members. The second one is engaged with community leaders and representatives. And the top one is partnership with those who directly engage with community. What this pyramid really represents is how the, what's, what are, which of these levels is the most effective. And we can see that the one at the bottom would probably be the most effective way to engage with the communities. Because it allows for the opportunity to have direct interactions with the community members, to hear their concerns, to hear their aspirations, and to really identify their needs. So the, however, the other two levels are important as well. And they're not mutually exclusive. And when we're talking about uh, partnership with those who directly engage with the communities, we usually mean community organizers. And community organizers are very important assets of communities because they really can mobilize the communities and help to connect us to the community. The second layer that we mean engage with community leaders and representatives. It can be representative faith-based organizations that have those connections with the community that are really vital and help us to really um, 
connect with the community members. Probably, if depending on which level of uh, engagement you choose, there will be implication on the resources. So, as you probably have done in your work, engaging with the community directly can be a very resource-intensive process. And sometimes you really have to balance it off. But again, we to keep our eyes on the price, uh, we might actually reach more in talking about this long-term sustainability by really engaging directly with community members. So what does it mean? What do we need to take into consideration uh, as we're approaching working with the communities on addressing equity? Right? This is our, a list of uh, different considerations that need to be taken into account. So the first one is really understanding the historical context. What does it mean? It's basically learning about the community. Have they been disfranchised before? What type of challenges they have been experiencing? This is very important to know before you approach the community. The second bullet is about building trust. Uh, and this takes time, takes a lot of learning. One, I think generally, sometimes we make mistakes by approaching communities at the point when we receive a grant or when we have a need, and not really going to the community before that. So this is one of the considerations is maybe you don't have a grant opportunity yet, maybe you don't have a project in mind, but you really go into the community to invest your time to get to know them, to start those conversations about not what you have in mind, but what their needs are, what, what, what their interests are, and really sustaining this throughout the process. Uh, the sub you can see there is also talking about focusing the issues of interest to them. Again, just really want to emphasize that there is really a lot of value to come to the, to the community without a preconceived idea, but rather ask the community, what do you think we should focus on? What policy do you think is impacting you and you would like to see um, a different decision-making process, a policy-making process? Really starting from that page. Next one is about really communication. Communication uh, takes certain skills, certain knowledge, but what's most important is to learn how to listen, to do, uh, to come to the community and listen to their issues, to their concerns. But in order to do that, we do need to have certain um, being culturally competent, and that can take different forms and shapes depending on what community is. Cultural competency can be understanding um, if there is a particular culture, like Somali culture, or if there's a particular population that speaks certain languages, if there is a male-dominant society. So you really have to understand those specifics in order to, to approach this community in the most um, effective way. The next one is identifying community spokespeople and leaders. And this is really essential uh, to understand the dynamics, to understand what are some most appropriate strategies to approach the community. There are a lot of barriers to participation, sometimes community experience. It can be the time required to do those engagements, to engage with, with the folks coming to their communities. It can be child care issues, that so they're not able to uh, attend certain meetings or participate meaningfully because they don't have a safe space for their children to be at. It can be also uh, the language barriers. So they might not be speaking the language and might need a translator in those meetings. It can be transportation issues. Or just in generally, they felt that the people that are coming to talk to them might have more education, might be more articulate, and they don't feel comfortable or safe to speak in their presence. So it's really important really to understand what all those barriers are, and some it, this information can really come from interactions with those folks, people, or leaders in the community, among, among other strategies. Investing in building the community capacity. This area can really um, help to advance work in the community. However, it, you need to be very considered of what capacities we're talking about. Sometimes we assume that the certain expertise or capacities are needed at the community, and uh, we um, emphasize that and work towards this. However, there is really a lot of opportunities uh, to actually ask the communities. Where do you think your, how we can increase your capacity? What type of skills do you think you need? Again, starting this listening and conversation and not coming up with particular strategies first. The, the, the other point I would like to make here is that it's also really valuable to include communities in your budget. And what that means is that if you have a budget, if you have a project, 
engaging community is great on the advisory capacity or in any other capacity, but it's also really meaningful to actually compensate them for their time. As we are, when we are usually going to the communities, we do get compensated uh, It's part of our work. In community members, we should really value their time. And one way to show it is actually pay for their time um, being a part of the team. The last point that I want to talk about is keeping an open mind. Uh, we, what that really means is that uh, there is a really value in technical expertise, which sometimes communities can offer, but there is also the value in just community expertise. Even if they don't have the value, uh, don't have the technical expertise, those insights, those stories, their reflection on uh, issues can really provide a very important insight for your work. And in order to do that meaningfully, we need to be ready to challenge our assumptions. And that might be one of the hardest things to do because we have our own viewpoint, which has been formed by our upbringing, by our education, by our parents, by interactions we had. But that reflecting on this can really help us to understand where community is coming from. So it's really self-reflection. Before going to the community, before engaging them to think about uh, what does our world look like? What shapes our world like this? Uh, how, why we relate to certain people in one way versus the others? And um, how do we decide which issues are important to us? What informs that decision? So by thinking about that can really help you to reflect and once you go in the community to understand more about why they're coming up with certain issues, why they have understanding of things the way they do and have this more of an open dialogue. So we really encourage all of you to challenge your assumptions and be open to the opinions that are different and uh, not try to really steer a community in a certain way, but rather understand where they're coming from, trying to see their perspective as much as you can. We, I talked a little bit about listening. Listening is a very important um, pro part of the process, and specifically because, but there is a different way to listen. Sometimes we we'll listen, but we don't really take time to digest and reflect on this information and build on that listening. When we speak about here about listening, we really mean not just gathering the information, but actually being for reflecting on this and incorporating in our future activities. So there are different ways to listen. This list is definitely not exhaustive, but this is some usual strategies that we have been using in the past. Um, community surveys is can be one, and it's, if it's well done, and uh, it can reach a lot of different community members and provide uh, perspectives. However, um, it's meaningful when it's done in several languages, when it is offered uh, offers through multiple ways to take a survey. Um, so you have to really think about that piece in order to gather as much information as possible. Community meetings and town halls is another opportunity which can allow for the valuable face time with the community and can really provide a good avenue to um, listen to community perspectives. Listening tours to share data, gather feedback, and listen to the community concerns is another way to do that. And also, um, it, so one of, one of the avenues that can really be a good platform for the listening tours can be face-based organizations can allow for that platform. Uh, really engaging, it can help you to really engage with those community leaders, but at the same time have access to the community members. So I think at this point we would like to take a minute and ask you to take another poll. Uh, we would like to get a sense how in your, in your past and your present work, what strategies have you used to listen to the community? So the options that we have there are surveys, focus groups, community meetings, working with faith-based organizations, or one-on-one -on -one conversations with the community. And if you don't have a particular way reflected in one of those choices, we would encourage you just to pick the one that um, you perhaps use more often than others. Let's just take a few more seconds.
Okay, so we will share the results. There, if you have a chance to close the poll, okay, then see the results coming. So it seems that there were different uh, results for different categories. However, focus groups were the first, uh, that had 68% of respondents said that they used focus groups to list their communities. And also the other choices include one-on-one -on -one conversations as well as the focus groups together. So it seems that the uh, participants in this particular webinar um, have used focus groups in their number one strategy as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations. Great. Thank you very much for taking this poll. And I would like to wrap up uh, our conversation about authentic engagement with examples that comes from Connecticut. And we picked that example because it really showed how important it is to sometimes stop and listen to the community, even if you have your plan, your game plan together, and you're ready to go in and uh, do the great work. But there is a moment where there might be an opportunity to step back and reflect on your plan. So in that particular example, uh, the, the town of Stanford, which has about 20,000 people, 30% of African American, 20% of Hispanic, and the city uh, developed a great plan to do the redevelopment of a trail in a blighted area. But however, before moving forward with this plan, they did decide to survey the residents and understand how they felt about this plan. So they're surprised they learned that the residents actually uh, had a different need. They felt that they really were hoping to receive uh, the support from the city and the motivation to get fit. So they were really looking for that versus the redevelopment of the trail. The city decided to um, postpone the plans. They really were thoughtful and brought reflect on this feedback and spend their time on, um, on those particular areas of need. So as a result, they, did, um, they didn't do the redevelopment right away, and they continued building a relationship with the community. One of the successes of that story, that the city really felt that in the long term, that really built a foundation for any future projects, and also build, uh, build, build the population trust in what the city will be doing. The city is really listening to their priorities. I will stop here and uh, Sarah will walk us through how to prioritize issues related to inequity. All right. Thank you, Tatiana, for sharing some tips about approaching issues of equity with a bit of humility and um, to putting community concerns first um, and really considering those before our own agendas. So as you've explored the data and listened to the community, you probably have come up with many potential issues to address because we know that we all have an opinion on um, what's affecting our own lives and what's important to us. Um, and so there's probably a lot of options for you going forward. So we'll talk about how to set specific priorities and move into action so that you are focusing on one or a few things rather than everything. So prioritization is a process where an individual or a group places items in rank order based on perceived or measured importance or, or significance. And this is important um, because everyone has their own perspective on what they think is important to them. The challenge is to bring together all of those perspectives and come to a common agreement on what we're going to do next. Um, and we know that, as we talked about, there is data where we can measure certain things and we can see um, with data what's going on in the community. Um, but there are also perceptions from the community. And those are just as, if not more important, um, than what we can see in the numbers. So we know that not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And so that's why we emphasize the importance of both perceived and measured importance. In terms of a process for prioritization, this is the process that we are proposing. Um, and that's first to define the criteria uh, by which each of the issues will be judged, to define a list of the issues, um, so to kind of pull together our results from uh, the, the data searching and the listening to the community uh, to come together and identify those issues and then develop an action plan. So we'll talk through some of those steps here. 
criteria um, are important because they're like the rules of the game. Um, you wouldn't want to go into a football game without knowing what it meant to get a touchdown. Uh, and so setting criteria is like setting those rules so people know what standards we're saying um, are, lead to something being important or not important. We've listed a few possible equity-related criteria here. Uh, we have magnitude, so this is how many people uh, does an issue affect, seriousness, how much of an impact does it have on quality of life, concern, and this is what we've heard from the community. So if this is something that, regardless of what data we have, the community is very concerned about it, we might give that some extra weight. Uh, disparity can capture the differences between population groups. And then the risks of inaction um, may be the consequences of not acting, and particularly which certain populations might be more impacted if we do or don't act. Um, and these are just some examples of commonly used criteria. So as you are working with your community, you may want to change some of these or add additional ones. Uh, but these criteria um, have been um, used in, in, in many different priority setting processes and have been adjusted a bit to reflect uh, an equity lens. So next you want to define a list to prioritize. So these are the items that you're going to be applying those criteria to. So the list might be based on the data that you found. So where are these issues needing attention in the social determinants or in the behaviors um, or in um, some of those other issues that we can see in the community, as well as community input. So what issues would the community like to address? What have they expressed is impacting their own lives that they would like to see um, action taken on? So here is an example list. Um, you, could, you may have come up with teen pregnancy, crime rates, food access, drug and alcohol abuse, infant mortality, health insurance, affordable housing, mental health issues. Um, so that's an example list. You may come up with additional ones like income inequality or poverty um, or the built environment. Um, but these are the ones that we'll use just for the demonstration today. So then you'll want um, once you have your list of issues and your criteria for ranking them, you'll want a process and some participants. Um, I'll propose a, a potential process that you can use for applying the criteria to the issues. There are a myriad of prioritization processes out there, and we are happy to share some resources with you um, on different types of prioritization processes that incorporate different, um, different methods. As you're identifying your participants and stakeholders, again, just thinking about um, bringing in the impacted community members uh, and asking them specifically to help prioritize the issues for action. You may even consider letting them do the prioritization on their own. And then um, the, the coalition or, or the support staff um, just going with whatever the community expresses as their primary concerns um, to support them in moving forward towards action. So here is a worksheet uh, that we've used for several different prioritization processes. What you can see is that the criteria that we proposed are listed across the top. So we have magnitude, seriousness, concern, disparity, and risk of inaction. And then those health issues are listed in rows across um, on, on the left there. And so what would happen if you were using this as your prioritization process is you would give this worksheet to each person. And each person, based on their own information that they have, whether they've been shared, um, whether you share data with them or um, whether they have their own personal uh, experience with each of these issues, they would rate each health issue based on how well they think it meets each of the criteria provided. So they might say, um, on a scale from one, which is low, to five, very high, their opinion about what they think, um, how well they think that particular issue matches the criteria. Um, and so this is just to note that this is kind of a, a gathering of everyone's perspective. It's meant to be more of a perspective gathering than an application of a specific, um, you know, statistical scale to each of those, um, each of those numbers. So for example, if I was uh, participating in this uh, prioritization process, I might take teen pregnancy, for example, and then um, look at the criteria across the top. So teen pregnancy, how many people are affected in my community? And based on what I know and my neighbors and, the, and the, the data that has been shared with me, I might rate teen pregnancy a three for a medium. Um, but I think it's pretty serious because it can impact the entire life course of a young woman um, and how well she's able to achieve future education um, and income, and, and it can also impact the life of her child. So for seriousness, I might put a five. Um, so each person would do this for each of the issues and for each of the criteria. Then at the end, um, all of the worksheets would be collected. 
the total ratings um, would be summarized for each person's worksheet and then added together for the group. And then each one would be given a rank order. Um, so at the end of this process, it's very important to bring that list back um, to the community to say, here's what this process resulted in. This is the first priority, second priority, third priority, etc. cetera. Um, and ask them if that reflects what they think is important in the community um, and to get consensus from the group that these issues that have been selected through the prioritization process um, um, represent something that, that they can live with and that they can move forward with. So it's important to remember that the process serves the group and the group doesn't um, you know, have to serve the process 100%. You can make changes after, after um, the results of the prioritization process, given that everyone is in agreement with how um, action is moving forward. So that's one example of how you might go about prioritizing issues based on data and community feedback. And the next step in the prioritization process is, of course, to develop an action plan and take action. And we have a few tips for you as you are integrating equity into action um, in the community. So as we've discussed, you want to make sure and use data to identify those disparities uh, and to change the narrative about what leads to health. So not just behaviors, but social determinants, and not just social determinants, um, but what drives differences in social determinants, which can be um, institutional power, the differential application of power, um, and, and those isms uh, that can be present in many of our communities. And not just looking at data, but engaging populations authentically early and throughout projects, which means giving them ownership and decision-making power uh, in moving forward and selecting the issues to address and how they will be addressed. Um, and finally, prioritizing improving the social determinants through policy change, because this can be applied at a community-wide level um, and really has the power to make a big difference in your communities. So with that, these are a few resources uh, that we'd like to share with you. Uh, the first one is from the CDC. Uh, it's a practitioner guide for advancing health equity, and it's a really handy resource, so we encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and then the second one is from the Prevention Institute, so it's moving from understanding to action on health equity. So um, now that you have a, a pretty good understanding and have participated in, in this conversation as well as others, um, thinking about a framework to move forward into action um, with your community. So we'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions that have come in through the chat box. We'd be happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Does it look like we have any questions now? Everybody's thinking hard. Looks like we have a question coming. All right. We wanna, Brandon has a question. Is there a way we could open his line? I don't know. Hey, Brandon, I think you'll need to use the chat box to ask a question. What's the most effective way to use the prioritization sheet? That's, that comes from not Brandon, but Troy. What's the most effective way to use this prioritization sheet? Yeah. Um, so the way that we've used it before is to give everyone the sheet. Um, and in this in this example, I've typed in the issues. Um, but when you're working with the community, you might write them in um, as you kind of determine what that candidate list of issues might be. And there are, if you have you know more than ten potential issues, there are some ways to kind of narrow it down before you get to this point. Um, but to share this sheet with everyone um, and just kind of explain the instructions to them. Um, you can also give people uh, input on what criteria show up there. So again, these are typed in. Um, we posed them for the purposes of this webinar um, just to kind of uh, give us a framework and an example. Um, but you can also incorporate uh, the group in determining what those criteria even are. So we can give you, if you're interested, a bigger list of uh, candidate criteria and you can narrow down that list which is a lot of prioritization, um, but that, if you want a more um, participatory process, that's one way to do it. 
Um, but yeah, just giving everyone this sheet, uh, handing that out to them so that they can indicate um, in each of those cells uh, their, their rating for each of the criteria on each of the issues. Um, and then I've used my computer to do uh, the summarization before. I have a spreadsheet set up so you can just kind of type in the numbers um, and it'll add it for you because that, that piece can be a little bit time consuming. So in terms of you know, doing it, I would recommend um, having this exercise, collecting the sheet, moving on to a discussion or a break or something um, so you can give the facilitator time to tally up everything and then coming back to discuss. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question, but if you have um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free. But Troy, Troy does have a little bit of a follow-up question. Uh, uh, would it be would it help to give an example, especially with different languages? Absolutely. So so in all of these examples, um, you want to make sure that they are. Um, they are appropriate for the population, and that's both in terms of language as well as literacy. So if this is something that might look a little bit too, um, too complicated for some populations, there are other methods of prioritization. Um, there's a really good resource sheet from NATO which we can share, um, and so we would be happy to do that. Uh, things like the nominal group technique where you kind of just go through and discuss and, um, and indicate using dots or something like that. Um, might be more accessible uh, for certain populations over others, but in all cases, you want to make sure and make it sure it's appropriate uh, for your population. We have just a couple more questions. Oh, were you going to follow up? Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add that one way to understand if the worksheet is appropriate to the lower population is to find a couple folks from that group that can take a look and providing suggestions. So if, if there's a project team that's developing that worksheet and then really run by the population that's most likely to be in the room that day, so they can provide that feedback, almost like a pilot test for this worksheet. Thanks. Um, you mentioned compensating the participants for the, their time. Uh, do you have an idea of how to do this? Gift cards, dinner, dinner lunch, hourly wage? Um, how do you feel participants value, what do you feel participants value more? Sure, that's a great question. We have been working on one of our projects in Minnesota on the um, drug reform and they had some of their population was attending the event, was uh, people that were formerly incarcerated and so they were on probation and they had those populations in the room to really drive the discussion and suggest the potential impact on them. So this group has decided that, and they actually how they determined the amount, they worked, uh, they worked kind of with their informal leaders and proposed um, that they would provide about $100 for each person in the visa card. Uh, and they have decided that that will be the most appropriate, that they're going to not have restrictions for this group, how they will spend it, given, you know, gift card from the certain store. So in, in, the, in the practical experience, I think the lesson learned was that it was, uh, they brainstormed a couple ideas with those who were representing this group and decided what would be the most appropriate ways. But in general, in practice, uh, we, we have seen there was different forms. Um, well, I think one of the important parts is just make sure if you have a budget to budget it in your budget, uh, in your project budget if possible, and then really outreach into this group, uh, to the groups you think got into asking what that would be the most appropriate form. So there can be gift cards, it can be a daycare that can be compensated, it can be just an, an hourly, on average, an hourly, uh, what, what you would get or what generally the population in your team would get for an hour of being in this meeting. So. Um, Again, just showing that appreciation for them being there. Mm -hmm. And that hundred dollars, I think, was for a full day, um, full day. workshop. And there are certainly trade-offs. So by giving a, a Visa gift card, which is probably you know those unrestricted funds are probably what those community members would value most, so that they can use their discretion um, to to make those decisions in terms of where to spend it or what to spend it on, um, is something that the community would value. But there are certainly trade-offs because there's that accountability and there's that trust that has to go both ways. Um, that you're going to trust that they spend it on something that is um, you know. Um, 
hopefully desirable in terms of helping them um, meet their needs and things like that. Uh, and so, so there are trade-offs, but I think that you know the best way to go is to um, give them the most decision-making power to the extent possible you can with your funds. Okay, we uh, looks like we have two more questions. Um, how can you incorporate a health equity lens into community health assessments that are done by hospitals and health departments? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so thinking about just kind of when you're looking through the data, so everything we talked about today are pieces that can be incorporated into a CHOP process. Um, the community health assessment, part of the requirement is to look into uh, the secondary data. Um, so those data sources that we shared and the types of breakdowns that we shared um, can be put into a, a report like that. Um, but there may be additional commentary that you can add um, that frames health equity and, and, and thinking about you know, why there are differences between certain groups and certain indicators in the community and, 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 and then moving into what can be done about it. Um, so, so certainly with the secondary data, um, you can incorporate that equity lens by kind of um, providing that narrative and those breakdowns by race and ethnicity or gender um, or, or uh, income. For the engagement, again, I think that it's important to really focus in on those populations that are hardest to reach. Um, so for the community, uh, community surveys and community health assessments that I've been aware of, you know, we always get the results back and, um, not always, but many times we get the results back and they are targeted to be representative of the population in terms of what the population looks like for educational status and income and gender. But often those, um, those groups that have lower income or lower educational status are underrepresented, underrepresented in those types of surveys. So really making special efforts to reach those populations and get their input. Those that are hardest to reach are often the ones that um, have the most need. Uh, and so whether that's you know, additional uh, work on the survey or a specific focus group uh, for populations who are vulnerable or who meet certain criteria in the community, and that'll differ by community. Um, you know, that's, that's another way to incorporate equity in a community health assessment. And again, the strategies. So identifying strategies that are prioritized by those impacted populations um, and that can really speak to uh, the policies and the things that shape those social determinants, which are the hard things to do, um, but should be incorporated um, in order to, to help make, make progress on equity. So those are just a couple of thoughts. And I think a lot of people are doing that already, um, but really just framing it as, you know, we, we want to make sure and have a specific focus on equity um, is a way to kind of highlight that for um, both the participants in the community health assessment and um, the community members as they're able to participate. And just to add to, uh, to what Sarah was describing is when you do the implementation piece to make sure that those groups are remain uh, on your project team or related project team, so you're transparent with them and reporting back, and they have the opportunity to guide um, the implementation of the strategies to decide uh, in a way what comes next, what the most appropriate one, specifically if there's any shift in the direction. Mm -hmm. So there's just multiple touch points throughout the process that they're staying meaningfully in the loop. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have one last question, and probably, probably we only have enough time for this one last question too. Um, leadership is a critical element for these kinds of community-based efforts that you described. Can you talk about how you see leadership fitting into this model of addressing health inequity and some specific strategies for providing leadership support to these efforts? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a great comment, and I agree that leadership is is key um, in in addressing these issues of health equity. So we can think about you know the KLC competencies and the concept that leadership is not a position; it's an action, um, and you don't have to be in charge of something um, in order to be a leader. So I think giving people um, giving people the ability to make decisions on their own um, and to to really uh, yeah, to, to really hand that over um, and to to provide a space for other people um, to exercise their own leadership is, is, is certainly a component of leadership. Um, and we know that this is um, this is something that's challenging work, so we can think about 
you know, raising the heat and really just kind of bringing up those hard conversations that people don't always want to have. We know that we know that talking about race and class and um, disadvantage is not comfortable. Um, and so really being able to be comfortable with bringing up those uncomfortable conversations and to handle those um, with with kind of a, a humility and a transparency uh, that you know that you're authentically trying to make um, change in the community and trying to make it better uh, and, and understanding your own perspective and where you're coming from I think are all, all pieces of leadership. Um, it's also, you know, this is not technical work, this is adaptive work. So this is changing the mindset um, of, of how many of our organizations operate um, and just how our communities kind of engage in issues around um, disadvantage and, and planning for the future and making sure that everyone has access to opportunities. So I think that um, I think there's a lot of ways that leadership can engage, um, but I would say to, to just keep in mind that you know you can you can give other people uh, a leadership opportunity here as well. Thanks thanks Sarah. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, leadership is going to be a, a uh, key component of our future HCI work. So as it was in our uh, pre previous HCI work. Um, uh, so that's something we'll all learn from, and we'll, we'll, we'll do some experiments around that. Um, uh, right now, I think we're, we're, uh, we're, about, we're past time right now. So I'm going to turn it over to Adrian. I, I know another question came up, and uh, we can try to answer that later. Uh, 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 Brandon, why don't you email me that, and we can we can have a conversation about that. Um, so so um, uh, you can go ahead and give, uh, maybe it isn't a question, maybe it's, it looks like, no, it looks like it's just a comment. So I'll just say it. Leadership is an action, not a position, is, is really a good way to think about it. Thanks for the perspective. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, I'll turn it over to Adrian now for, to close this out. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And thank you very much, Sarah and Tatiana, for a, a great discussion about health equity today. Um, just in closing, the webinar will be recorded, as I said earlier, and posted on SharePoint within the next several days. You'll be receiving an email uh, with a link to a short survey to obtain your feedback about the webinar. And, and as always, you really do value that information and use it for planning upcoming webinars and events. And finally, the next semi-monthly reporting forms are due on March 15th. That's it. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.